I do not believe Arthur Schopenhauer was a passive nihilist, as Nietzsche called him, but a negative utilitarian, Avon Lalette, before the philosophy existed. He was a man far ahead of his time. He said that suffering was evil, clearly an ethical judgment. Nietzsche was a nihilist. He said that there was no good or evil, and everything is just fine. He was a deluded elitist, but that's another subject. Well, we're going to be responding to, the, to this comment here, so you guys will be able to see it, uh, by uh, this guy. Uh, he says, uh, I'm not sure what you meant by negative utilitarianism not being comprehensive enough. It is a philosophical system that uh, one can live by to solve ethical problems, uh, whereas antinatalism is a f uh, simple, is simply a philosophical position. Uh, there has to be an underlying philosophy behind it, uh, whether it's consequentialism or deontology, etc. Antinatalism and transhumanism are both uh, NU positions, and the transhumanists suffer from optimism bias. I agree. I would say, first off, that not starting a, a life at all is way more comprehensive of an approach than dealing with any problems while you're here. So it's like, it's another, uh, it's almost like the... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so antinatalism is, that's what I meant by saying antinatalism is much more comprehensive than negative utilitarianism in terms of dealing with, like, the problems that while well, we're already here. So, I, so, again, I would say that not starting life at all is way more comprehensive of an approach than dealing with any problems while you're here. I'm not clear how one can form a theory of ethics starting from extinction. That, to me, is the end goal, not the starting point of ethical philosophy. I feel like superhuman dance is ignoring the fact that we are on a world full of life and problems caused by it. If there were no people, there'd be no need for philosophy, so I don't really understand this criticism. If negative utilitarianism is done correctly, its conclusions are the same as antinatalism and nephilism. In my mind, they are the same philosophy. Even though he also makes rights-based arguments in Better Never To Have Been, Benatar's axiological asymmetry is a negative utilitarian argument. However, if one accepts Benatar's conclusion that coming into existence is always a harm, then deontologists would also have to come to the antinatalist side. To me, this shows that all deontologists are actually consequentialists, because you have to use consequentialism to determine what is right and wrong. Once discovered, it can become a rule. So Benatar's axiological asymmetry begins as a negative utilitarian one, until it becomes a fact then it can become a deontic argument, or an ethical duty to prevent birth. Okay, so we are going to go back to the basics of philosophy in this video, and try to find out exactly where Superhuman Dance and I disagree. I want to state for the record that both he and I seem to agree on most subjects, so this is just a clarification of definitions. I am a negative utilitarian, and will defend that philosophy the best of my ability. I believe confusion, a category of suffering that he talks a lot about, is the problem here. Not on my part, but on his. He seems to believe that all negative utilitarians are anti-extinction transhumanists. My argument is that most negative utilitarians are not only anti-natalist, but also be ethically compelled to push the big red button and end all life on Earth, if a Death Star scenario was possible. The only criticisms I usually hear against negative utilitarianism are those with an obvious Pollyanna optimism bias. They construct silly dilemmas like what if the only pain in life was a simple pinprick to your finger, but you could also have a hundred orgasms a day? Would you be so negative now? Wouldn't life be so awesome? You still want to destroy the world? These are stupid, nonsense arguments like those of Toby Ord and Peter Singer, as they do not even respect the reality of life on Earth. They think there is such a thing as positive utility that can possibly compare with the enormous suffering. The one and only positive act is to prevent messes or clean up messes. One's personal pleasure is meaningless to all other sentient minds, but one's suffering is a problem for all of those who are aware of it. Suffering needs our immediate attention. Pleasure does not. This is the conclusion of a negative utilitarian. If you reach an illogical conclusion, you must check your premises. You'll find that one of them will be wrong. Transhumanists make several errors in their premises. For one, there's no evidence of a suffering-free life. It is only a theoretical concept like dark matter, something that may be possible in the future. And two, it is not possible now. It is of no help in ending suffering in the year 2018. And three, they can't justify creating need in order to feed it, even if it was pain-free need. It's illogical. 
So in other words, transhumanism is science fiction. It is not rational or feasible and cannot be justified compared to extinction. There's still no reason to create life. But just because a philosophy leads to some illogical conclusions, it should not reflect negatively on the philosophy itself. So my summed up response to Superhuman Dance is that he should go back and adjust his premises. Negative utilitarianism is a comprehensive philosophy with conclusions that are provable with logic. There is a section on negative utilitarianism right on the anti-natalism wiki page. The two philosophies are quite compatible and quite similar. There are anti-natalists who are moral nihilists. There are even Christian anti-natalists. So you can't say just because some deluded negative utilitarians believe that technology can cure suffering, this is somehow a ding against negative utilitarian philosophy. Let's look at it from the opposite point of view, the natalist perspective. Is natalism a comprehensive philosophy? It's taken for granted as a default position for ignorant traditionalist humans. It is a definite philosophical position, but is it a theory of ethics? I don't think many would say so. It certainly assumes that life is good and worth creating and thereby destroying, but it is not a comprehensive system. For instance, many people on Earth come to natalism from theism. Their religion tells them what their position on procreation should be. Take a Mormon male. His theology tells him to not only procreate, but to do so in mass numbers, even taking multiple wives to achieve this end. To say that Mormons have flawed premises is an understatement, but their natalist view clearly came from their flawed system of ethics. I do not consider natalism or antinatalism to be a complete ethical system, but rather an ethical position. Natalism and antinatalism are only positions on one single problem, birth. Neither one necessarily leads to other philosophical positions. When dealing with overall logical consistency, uh, you know, it, 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 it has problems, uh, you know, due to the fact that our evolutionary position has led us to basically require optimism bias to some extent, uh, which I think is sept- separate from feeling good. But, uh, however, uh, in order to hold, to, to hold motivation to learn more, to learn more philosophy, <laughs> you basically have to have, uh, which, which, which will eventually bring you to the conclusion of antinatalism, if you are being honest enough with it, uh, you have to get things like sleep, you know, you have to get things like food, like water, uh, you know, enough carbohydrates that are rich in antioxidants and fiber and uh, uh, and and carbohydrates and if you're not you know an activity so those things all that all those things that I just talked about could be associated with optimism bias if you're you know but they really aren't they're just built into your evolution so then he talks about our evolution requires optimism bias So what I think Superhuman Dance is trying to say here is that you need to be able to use arguments like appeal to emotion uh, that are technically illogical, but will help convince people to the anti-natalist position. Well, you have to remember that negative utilitarians are consequentialists, and you have to do what you have to do to convince people to not have children, so a negative utilitarian would not necessarily be against lying or appealing to emotion. I mean, if it was, you know, more of a certainty that that would convince someone. But generally he's right, we were going to appeal to logic and facts first. He then goes into a discussion of lifestyle here, uh, which is beyond the subject of this video. I somewhat agree with this. Uh, You can just look at my videos and see that my life has also been influenced by Durian Ryder, uh, Harley Johnstone. I've stopped drinking alcohol for the most part, given up caffeine. I eat a high carb vegan diet, I drink a shitload of reverse osmosis water, eat bananas every day, and even bought a bike. But this is really not the subject, Uh, so I'm not sure why he's telling me all these things. Um, I used to eat 10 bananas a day like he does, uh, you know, in one smoothie. Uh, But what Durian Ryder and Freely didn't mention is that if you do that and you don't bike for 4 hours a day, you're going to get fat. My wife and I both gained 10 pounds on Rato 4. Sleep is the tough one with how much I work. Uh, I tend to think there's plenty of time for sleep in the grave. Plenty of active people survive on six hours of sleep a night, so I have too much shit to do to sleep all goddamn day. And I think he overestimates how much someone needs to live the Durian Rider healthy lifestyle. I mean, look at In Mendham, one of the most intelligent, lucid, and logical philosophers alive today. 
he said that he barely eats any fruits or vegetables and instead survives on basically a starch solution kind of diet of pasta, rice, and potatoes because they're cheap. And he smokes cigarettes for fuck's sake. Cigarettes! He's inhaling free radicals constantly. And yet his brain works very well. So while Superhuman Dance and I both agree that it's important to eat like Dr. Gregor and Freely the Banana Girl, we do it primarily to prevent disease later in life. Besides getting that sugar rush in the morning from fruit that has been a nice caffeine replacement for me, it's not going to make me or anyone else do philosophy better. I would like to see some evidence of this claim. It can't hurt, but it's not as important as SHD thinks. Personally, I don't care if people want to eat like shit and stay up all night. Just don't eat any animals and don't have any kids. Another problem with uh, you know, the bike riding hobby, especially doing it too much, is there's a lot of risk. I don't like sharing the road with motor vehicles. I believe in the low-risk lifestyle as much as is humanly possible. Obviously, I drive to work, which is taking more risk than I am comfortable with, but I don't have much choice. So again, sorry for this sidebar, um, but he did talk about this in the video, so I felt like I should address it. Um, but this is just not the main subject here. When I was researching veganism, those who were utilitarian seemed to be the most logical and hardcore animal rights activists. For instance, from the negative utilitarian viewpoint, chickens are animals who are experiencing the most unnecessary, brutal torture and in the highest numbers. So we should target the chicken and egg industries first. I don't know how you would apply antinatalism as your calculus here. Clearly an antinatalist would want to stop breeding all livestock animals immediately in accordance with his beliefs, or would he? We have antinatalists like Wessel Zapf who say things like this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the connection between veganism and, and antinatalism, but it is interesting. Well, the co connection is that if uh, one person uh, supports the factory farms, then it creates more birds from uh, for the animals. Oh yeah, yeah that's a good point. A majority of antinatalists are meat eaters. What does that tell you? Antinatalism is not a philosophy that is spilling over into anything beyond human procreation. Some antinatalists just hate their parents and hate their lives. They might not have any other ethical beliefs necessarily. You would think that every single antinatalist would understand and use Benatar's axiological asymmetry argument, but no, there's actually a faction now that says it commits a logical fallacy and that a potential person coming into existence is not bad. It is neutral. I don't grok this argument, but it does exist. So what I'm saying is that it would be more useful if we were all coming from a consequentialist theory of ethics rather than any of this virtue ethics, categorical imperative, theology, and especially nihilism stuff. If you have a solid theory of ethics, then you know what to do. Antinatalism just doesn't really apply to other areas of philosophy necessarily, just like veganism does not. Again, uh, the premise that I started this out with better to not start life at all, and uh, in order to further those arguments, you have to play the evolutionary game well, uh, well enough to be able to further the arguments of this. You have to play it better. You have to be a, uh, you have to try to be a better gladiator. He almost seems to be using the appeal to nature fallacy here, saying that we need to incorporate optimism bias. Negative utilitarianism is based on logic, not emotions. It is as emotionless a philosophy as one can have. That's why Mr. Spock is a utilitarian, and that's why I use this system. I don't want emotion to touch any of my arguments. He then goes into a David and Goliath metaphor, saying that David must use the weapons his enemy is using. I wish he would have elaborated on this so I could better understand, because then he goes back to... Uh, you have to get the, the water, the plant foods that are rich in antioxidants, carbohydrates, and fiber, and then get activity on a daily basis. So there's a major problem with negative utilitarianism uh, because uh, it, it focuses on uh, reducing all of the, um, the, you know, the pain versus the, the pleasure, uh, you know, just focusing on the pain, reducing that. But this is while we're already here. This is dealing with problems while we're already here. So that's why I said at the beginning of this that starting a life is more, comp you know, not starting the life at all is a more comprehensive approach than dealing with any problems while you're here. So as I mentioned earlier, what I think is happening is that superhuman dance is associating David Pierce's flawed negative utilitarianism with the philosophy as a whole. 
when I tried to listen to this as if I were a transhumanist, it started to make a little more sense to me. Pierce says that human extinction is not a viable option, and that's the optimism bias right there. Of course it's an option. We're going extinct, it's just a matter of time. I'm pretty sure that's what SHD is saying. However, transhumanism is not a position the majority of negative utilitarians are going to agree with or accept. It's illogical. It's a small faction of science fiction reading dreamers. Negative utilitarian philosophy leads in a straight line to the asymmetry of pain and pleasure, and the conclusion that creating life is always a harm and is therefore always unethical. Ethelism, on the other hand, is a broader philosophy than antinatalism. To me, it is similar to negative utilitarianism in that its motto is, suffering sucks. And that is basically my motto as a negative utilitarian ethelist. The transhumanists don't accept that. If you remove the suffering completely, what will be left? They wouldn't even be human anymore. There's a concept called the paradox of hedonism that says, in pursuing nothing but pleasure, you make certain that pleasurable things will eventually no longer be pleasurable to you. Transhumanism is a dead end. We need to pull the plug as gracefully and as soon as possible. Um, obviously, like, you have to... Like, I'm gonna in inevitably step and kill a rabbit, probably, by buying some lentils. You know what I mean? Maybe. Who knows? Okay? Uh, because it's gonna get minced up in some lentil farm somewhere uh, while, you know, something is happening. That doesn't... That what, what What's important to understand about that, though, is that that's my unfortunate position of already being here, you know, uh, that, that, that's, that's, this is just to give one example. So if you're going to follow like a negative utilitarian, uh, route, I think that the major problems with it, it's overall, uh, consistency is that it just, it prevents you, um, from, from being able to deal with the, with the evolutionary, uh, position that you have been landed in. I know this all too well. I haven't just indirectly killed rabbits by buying lentils. I've had to kill them with my own hands. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, but I live out in the sticks and my dogs sometimes maul small animals and leave them still alive and suffering. By the time I get to them, they're jerking and flopping around clearly in excruciating pain. I have to kill them mercifully and as quickly as possible. And for anyone who wants to know, the fastest way to end the life of a small animal is to just bash their skull in with a shovel or a hammer, whatever you have. Just do it fast and do it hard. Your foot or hands are probably not powerful enough. This is why I'm so into ethics and especially a mathematical system like utilitarianism. When I have to make a decision, especially for someone else, I don't want to be confused by optimism, by my childhood Catholic indoctrination, or by any emotions. I weigh the circumstances. Okay, a baby rabbit is in pain, and I can either just leave it and let it suffer with the very remote possibility that he will be magically healed and hop away, or I could put him in a box and try to nurse him back to health so he can later be killed by some other predator, or I could simply end his suffering immediately. Based on the evidence, there's no coming back from those injuries. It had to be done. I could have let God take care of it, just let him die slowly, but that would have been wrong. Even though I knew the act of killing would disturb me for years, you know, it does as I'm talking about it now. I knew it was the right thing to do because of utilitarian calculus. That's why I hate being alive, and I hate this fucking planet. My parents put me here against my will and forced me to make these kinds of decisions. The one I can't hold accountable is my dog. She was bred to hunt down little animals, and she has an instinct to do so. I don't even know how many rabbits my dogs have killed and eaten. I've lost count. As an anti-natalist, I know that prevention is the best medicine, so I put a fence around my yard to keep the rabbits out. I've saved many of them this way, at least from getting mauled by dogs. But sadly, some of the rabbit moms somehow think that if they can get inside the fence, they'll be safe from the animals outside of it when it's the other way around. You know, when I have to make a terrible decision like that, I try to think of one of my heroes, Ingrid Newkirk. She started out working in an animal shelter, and she saw how cruelly the, her coworkers would treat the animals before euthanizing them. So she decided to go in early every day and do it herself. I couldn't put dogs and cats to death every day, day in, day out like she did. I just couldn't do it. So she's stronger than I am, and that's why I look up to her. I think that uh, there's no way for a, a negative approach to purely, uh, a purely negative appro approach to uh, persuade people. I don't think that there's any way that you could do that because there's, you know, 
Now, it won't persuade everyone. It'll only persuade the people that have ex- that are glib enough to. I'm sorry. Um, not not glib. You know, they just ha- they haven't experienced the suffering. You know, uh, or they have experienced the suffering in in one way or another. Whether they put it through their own eyes or whether they uh, were able to see it through other people's shoes or a combination of both things. I think that ultimately uh, that's what the major problems with uh, just being applying negativity to your life uh, happen. So to summarize it again uh, is, you know, sleep, make sure you get the fucking sleep. Superhuman Dance says, there is no way a negative approach will convince people. I disagree with this because it persuaded me. It's persuaded many others. I assume being exposed to the negative side of life made you become a vegan and an antinatalist. You just have to show people the overwhelming evidence that there is no profit in life. It's impossible. If you somehow cured pain and death, then you would still be stuck with boredom, which is suffering. It just won't end until life does. In fact, I believe negative utilitarianism is the strongest logical reason to go antinatal. I mean, is this a positive story or a negative one? It's pretty goddamn brutal and violent to me. Yet this icon of a man getting horribly tortured and murdered has inspired billions of people to join a cause. So it is important not to just present natalists and meat eaters with the horrific, but also examples like the planet Mars and the moon. Explain to them that this is what is ideal, a peaceful world without sentient life, without suffering. If others want to appeal to the emotions of the deluded as a tactic, go ahead, but personally I can't do it. I can only use logical arguments. So now I'd like to cover the more broader topic of defining antinatalism. What is it and how people arrive at this philosophical position? Superhuman Dance made me consider all of this because at first I thought he was saying that antinatalism is a complete philosophy, and I'd always thought of it more as a position, not a full ethical system. So after watching the video, I'd be really interested uh, if you viewers would post in the comments how you came to antinatalism, and if you practice one of the main categories of ethics. Even if you are a theist, I'd like to hear from you. I'll make this a little more interesting and start a contest in the comment section of this video. Whomever gives the most interesting reply about how they became an antinatalist, I will reward with a custom portrait of your favorite philosopher. Yes, even if it's Kant. If people want to vote on their favorite comment, just use the thumbs up button. Okay, so all philosophy starts basically with observing nature, uh, evidence, facts. Science, of which philosophy is a part, then determines how we interpret nature to come up with theories. Normative ethics is the category of ethics that deals with right and wrong. Off to the side, we have metaethics, which deals with interpreting and defining reality. So we have atheism, the correct conclusion that there are no gods, and theism, the mistaken belief that reality is the work of an architect. Off to the right is metaethics, the more abstract way of thinking about ethics. It can lead to moral anti-realism, denial of good or bad, and the dark hole of moral nihilism. Below normative ethics, we have the two main branches of thought. There are others, but these are the main two. Consequentialism and deontology. Consequentialism is self-explanatory. It is concerned with the consequences of actions and nothing else. Deontology is concerned with rule-based ethics. Consequentialism leads to positive or classical utilitarianism and negative utilitarianism. Deontology leads to philosophies like egoism and Kantianism. You can see below the further specialized categories. Egoism is the basis for objectivism. Kantianism is the basis for natural law philosophy, like that of Stefan Molyneux. The most famous philosopher alive is Peter Singer, and he uses preference utilitarianism, a kind of classical utilitarianism. Negative utilitarianism leads to the point of view of this channel, and emendum and ephilism. Then below these philosophical theories, we finally have the philosophical positions, like effective altruism, veganism, natalism, antinatalism, and transhumanism. So it seems like Superhuman Dance is trying to say that he went directly from observing reality straight to the position of antinatalism. However, in my opinion, there had to be something in the middle of his reasoning. If he became an antinatalism because he saw that life is suffering and suffering is bad, then he is a consequentialist. If he became antinatalist because he thinks it should be a universal rule that impositions are wrong and people should never be used as ends, then he is a deontologist. But some ethical theory is at work here. 
you have to have a system of value judgments before you can say something is right or wrong. Uh, for instance, I am a consequentialist first, a negative utilitarian second, and a vegan antinatalist third. You don't need a theory of ethics to be an atheist because atheism has no ethical position. However, many atheists make the mistake of going right from atheism to metaethics and moral nihilism. So I have some questions uh, for Superhuman Dance or any non-utilitarian antinatalist. How do you apply antinatalism to problems other than procreation? Why are so many antinatalist meat eaters? Like Wessel Zapf, the YouTuber, said he eats meat and didn't even know what the meat industry had to do with antinatalism. But one can be a pro-human like Zapf and still be an antinatalist. He even had a pet store hamster. Clearly his antinatalism has not encouraged him to think more broadly about ethics. Uh, many antinatalists are simply environmentalists, like vehement. Antinatalism implies reducing harm, respecting consent, and pain over pleasure in the realm of procreation alone. One would be free to adhere to these points solely for procreation, yet ignore them in other areas of life. Um, I saw this example on another website. An equivalent would be a vegan who would not use animal products, but would support purebred dog breeding. So in my opinion, antinatalism is not comprehensive enough because it allows too many contradictions. Just in the same way, veganism is not a complete ethical system or moral theory. Negative utilitarianism is an example of a complete theory of ethics. It is comprehensive. You can throw any ethical dilemma or question at it and you'll get a logical and consistent response. It is a scientific and mathematical way to understand good and bad, right and wrong. Antinatalism doesn't necessarily allow one to discover these things on their own. Coming from a position of antinatalism can cover some similar ground like cloning is bad, but only because that is so close to procreation. But how does an antinatalist deal with war? How does he deal with the ethical trolley problems? Antinatalism has only one precept. Do not create human beings. So beyond that, I believe that everyone is really a negative utilitarian, even if they don't realize it themselves. I believe that superhuman dance and everyone else on Earth is a negative utilitarian and they just don't know it and don't apply it logically to every part of their lives. They may try and say that negative utilitarianism isn't convincing, but as soon as they have to get a root canal or some chemotherapy, it will become crystal clear to them that pain and suffering is the only ethical consideration. Preventing it is our obligation. Happiness or joy has little to no place in ethics. Even deontologists must use consequences in their arguments. I think most of us stop at red lights because we're trying to avoid negative outcomes. The asymmetry is a negative utilitarian argument. Antinatalism is a negative utilitarian position. Negative utilitarianism is the best ethical theory we have to solve problems. Okay, thank you for watching. I hope that this video helps at all. I hope it creates some discussion on uh, what is antinatalism and where it comes from, how we get there, and how we can move forward. So thank you for watching. I look forward to your comments below. I'd also like to thank Superhuman Dance for so quickly replying to a comment I left on one of his previous videos. It was, I think within 15 minutes he had left me a video response, so thanks.